Welcome back to Bible study. Uh, this is not welcome back to Peter, first or second epistle, or welcome back to Colossians, or even welcome back to Isaiah, because we're starting a new book, uh, the book of Acts. Uh, we still have the triumvirate of Alan Tun. Good evening, Tim. Good to see you, Alan. And Reverend Ian Bell. Ian Bell, <laughs> yes. The yes. right reverend. <laughs> yeah, yes. The venerable. No. Do you remember? Do you remember the Venerable Bede? Yes, I do. Yes, yeah. coming from the northeast of England. Uh, yes, yeah. we we do remember the Venerable Bede. Yeah, amazing. Great, great man of God. Absolutely. Celtic, and Celtic Christianity is a fascinating subject. If you absolutely. ever have an opportunity to read it, and the conflict between Roman Catholicism and Celtic Christianity is a fascinating read. Brilliant. Well, we'll bring it, I'm sure we'll find an opportunity as we go from the Acts and we stretch it to our place here in Britain in the 21st century. And uh, my name is Tim Vince and I'm just a punter. I don't have any real credentials to be here, but you know, my only actual credential is doing Bible study, <laughs> which I'm delighted to be here. It's wonderful. Uh, so we're going to start by reading uh, from Acts chapter 1, Ian's going to start and then Alan will pray. Thank you, Tim. I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version of the Bible and Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Philophilus. Theophilus. 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 <laughs> I'll start again. No, go for it. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with him, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you take this time, this next hour or so, and you glorify your name through our studying of your word. And I pray for those viewers watching this Bible study. I pray, Lord, that they will come into such fresh revelation directly from you, that they will draw close to you and they will transcend their daily issues, any possible problems and be really, really connected, truly connected to the living God. And may your words also elevate all of us, Lord, and help us to seek your kingdom and the perfection of your will on this earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wonderful. I'm pleased that we, we've, we're, we're back to a, a narrative which uh, we love the teaching. Yeah. Um, epistles and Isaiah, you know, some depth there. Uh, but here we have, is it the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of Paul, the Acts of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. 
We know that it's written by Luke. Give Alan the first shot. But it's good for us. I don't think we're going to even cover this amazingly short passage. So we're just going to have an introductory on Acts, I think. Let's yeah. wait and see. Yeah. For those not necessarily familiar with all the books of the Bible, um, you know, somebody just reading the Bible straight through from cover to cover may not realise because John comes between Luke and Acts, okay? And the thing is that Acts is, if anything, a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. Mm. So if, the, if they had, if whoever compiled, not wrote the Bible, because we know that the Bible was written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's scripture for us, okay? But somebody compiled the books. And in one sense, the order in which they were compiled that's up for debate because you could do it chronologically, you can do it thematically, any number of ways. And if they had placed John before Luke, we would have seen, say, Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts, yeah. Romans, 1 Corinthians. That being the case, but then we, we would, would have see said, the... Oh, well, John doesn't quite fit in because the others are synoptics. You know, so you I can't understand. win. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't win. You can't win. And chronologically, John was written after all the others had been written as well. So from that perspective, you know, there's any number of ways of slicing this cake, as it were. Yeah. But I think the main point, as far as the introduction to the book of Acts is concerned, is read Luke. Yeah, in because in my first book, Theophilus. Th that's it. That's it. And the other thing that I picked up is, <clears throat> he said, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke himself says, I started telling you what Jesus began to do. Mm. So, as far as Luke was concerned, the author Luke, Jesus' death and resurrection wasn't the end of the story. Yeah, just the beginning. It was just the beginning. Wonderful. Just the beginning. And so what we see in Acts, as you say, Acts of who? Yeah. Acts of the Holy Spirit, continued Acts of acts Jesus, of Jesus. Yeah. through the Holy Spirit. I forgot to mention that, I, I rattled <laughs> through the others, but yeah. Saying that it's what he began to do. That's right. And so Luke obviously has this thing, and I think we really need to grasp it, that Jesus is still active in the world today. Mm. Yes, Stephen says he's sitting at the right hand of God. That is true. Revelation says the same thing. So both Stephen and John yeah, uh, say that Jesus is at, sitting at the right hand of God, but that is his position yeah. as opposed to his activity. Yeah. He's still very much totally active in the world today. Um, just to add um, one or two little insights, uh, Luke is sometimes called Luke the Evangelist. Mm -hmm. He is referred to in Colossians as a physician. A, an interesting side, side line which I find amusing is you know when the woman is healed of the bleeding and the other gospels mention that he'd spent all, they'd spent, he'd, she'd spent all the money on physicians. Luke admits that, or the only one gospel that oh, actually admits that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because he's a physician, he doesn't want to say it's a waste of money. Uh, anyway, that, that, that's a, a, a quite an insight. Um, and yeah. was Luke there? So, you know, the synoptic gospel that, of Luke, yeah. um, obviously, you know, there was a lot of uh, oral tradition, yeah. uh, and he, there, there, there are stories that are in both Matthew and Mark that Luke writes. Uh, was he just a scholar who picked up on all well, the current, or was he there with the well, Lord Jesus? One of the theories is that, you know, when uh, Stephen is uh, stoned. stoned to death mm. and they laid the clothes at the feet of a young yeah. man, tradition is, is that was Luke. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, that, oh that, I've always thought that was Saul. So, no, no I thought it was Luke. I thought it was okay. Luke, yeah. Okay. Well, I may be yeah. wrong. That's, that's what okay. I heard. Oh, wow. Uh, there's another bit, which is at the end of 2 Timothy, uh, Paul mentions Luke, but in context of people deserting him, yes. except for Luke. Except for Luke. At the end, he says, be diligent. So he's writing to Timothy from Rome. Yeah. And so he finishes off his letter by saying, be diligent to come to me quickly. Yeah. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, 
and has departed for this in Lyca. Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Yeah. Yeah. Get Mark to bring, bring him with you. So Luke was sticking with Paul yeah. all the way to the... That's amazing, really. But I suppose my question is, was he also with the Lord Jesus, but not obviously one of the 12? No, I, I think that he came later onto yeah. the scene. Yeah. Yeah. He was That's like Paul. Paul never knew Jesus yeah. during his earthly ministry. That's what I think, yeah. And I, I think Luke didn't yeah. either. That's right. If anything, Luke came to the faith even after Paul did. Okay, we can talk more about Luke, which we certainly will. Um, who is this chap, Theophilus? Which well, must he, mean lover of God. Yeah, well, he, he's the recipient yeah. of the two letters yeah. that Luke wrote. The first is the gospel, what we know is the gospel of Luke, but at the time it was just a letter. Yeah. I'm, yeah, okay. I'm going to correct myself. Okay. It was yeah. at the feet of Saul. Okay, okay. I apologise. Yeah. No, it's fine. Um, it's, but he's obviously there with... Because yeah. he describes it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he I... describes it. So it's, well, frankly, when you go through this, what an epic life Luke lived. We yeah. often think of what an epic life Paul yes. lived. But oh, Luke, Luke was Luke with was some of it, uh, with Paul in some of the shipwrecks and yeah. his journeys and things. He was a, a travelling companion for much of the time. Yeah. Uh, and I think we'll come to, you yeah. know, the we passages later where the, the, the Acts in the later chapters of Acts, yeah. he would say, we went from here to there instead of Paul exactly. went. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, we, um, and we could be more than just Paul, because when we, us, yes. were uh, doing the study on Peter, we were talking about the role of Titus yes. uh, in, in writing things down. So, um, can yeah, I, though, can Paul I, wasn't alone. Can I read yes, plus do. one of Luke? Yes, please do. Uh, uh, which gives us an insight into, the, yeah. we, you know, was he just gathering together information or was he there? Yes. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to them to us, it seemed good to me also having a, a, had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, mm -hmm. that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Wonderful. It seems to me that he, he is gathering together the, all the information. Mm. Yeah. And it has a stamp of authenticity, doesn't yeah. it? He's not claiming, he's not saying, oh yeah, I saw this, I, you know, I, I was part of that. And yeah. you know, a bit like Forrest Gump, I was, I was there, a witness to history. He, he's just basically saying this is an honest account of what happened. Yeah. Yes, and, and he gathered information. Yeah. Forensically. From pe yes, from people who were eyewitnesses, as well as other people, yeah. from lots of people. Mm. And it's interesting, you know, without being proud or boastful, he manages to arrive at a position where he's able to say, and this is scripture, that uh, I seem to have obtained a perfect understanding of what happened. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. That's quite something. And, and historians, when they look through the Gospels, they say there's a ring of authenticity about yeah. it. It's not... Uh, it, it doesn't look as though it's been written by an all-powerful church, let's say, or political, you know, potentate who wants to record history for his own self-aggrandizement. It is often counter-cultural. Not only that, it's not pushing an agenda either. No, it's just saying this happened. And yeah. it, it is counter-cultural because, you know, the role of women is quite clear. And that, mm -hmm. if you were just trying to sort of exercise some political agenda, you wouldn't have put that in there. So it, that's why it has this ring of authenticity. Uh, first of all, Theophilus, quite right, could be in translated lover of God. Yeah. Do you know why I know that? Because my, my name, or well, apart from Philo this and Philo that and Europhile, and yeah. I don't want to go down there, but uh, my name is Timotheus, and I, I, you know, I started looking into, oh, that means um, lover, uh, that means one who worships God. Yeah. But yeah. Philo means a lover. Yeah. It, it, it could be... A, Mind you, it could be a shortened version of a friend of God. Yeah, OK. Uh, it, it may not have been a particular person. It could be literally yeah. to the lovers of God. 
Yes. In, in, a, in general. Oh, that's interesting. In general. Or, or it, it could be a particular person who was given a nickname. You know, like uh, Barnabas was called the encourager. Yeah. You know, he, he could yes. have been given a nickname like yes. that. Although, you do find, I used to play with, with a, a golf with a, a man whose, whose nickname was... Uh, Theophilus, sorry, whose surname was Theophilus, and it was a good point of witness. He, he, yeah. spent, he, he must have been in his nearly 60, and he didn't know what his, his the name... The meaning of his name, name would you uh, believe it? It was a good, I, a good I wonder, point of witness. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I wonder whether he might have helped finance some of the journeys of Paul or something. Oh, I, He I, wanted I, a little bit, yeah, and so Luke, yeah, basically, because it, it, it takes a lot of time out from your profession of being a doctor to write all of this stuff. Yes, I know, I um, know, and it's very detailed. You need your daily it's, thread and the yes. roof over your head. Yes, it's, it's very detailed. Mm. Um, and one other thing, if this is just an a in introduction rather than yeah, just looking at sure. the verses that we just read out. Um, whereas Luke rounds off the, what we know as the Gospel of Luke, his first letter to Theophilus, mm -hmm. by saying, Amen. In other words, that's the end of this letter, and then yep. he starts the next one by saying, I wrote to you previously, and this is more information, okay? He doesn't end the, the book of Acts. He doesn't end. Yeah. There's no amen, That's there's nothing really good at the end. That's really it's almost like either he's still writing it, and he passed away, or he, you know, he wasn't able to anymore, or the last bit was missing, and, and that's all we have. Or he's just handing the baton on to us and the succeeding generations. Spiritually, of course, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes, that, I mean, spiritually, the, the baton is being handed yeah. to the current. But as you say, the continuity, the end of Luke has the ascension, you know, and there, and there you have the, the ascension. Ascension as being the opening, of Acts. opening chapter of Acts, yes. A little bit more detail. Is it, you know, all of us, we write a letter or we write something, we think, oh, no, we should have got that in, you know, and, and so oh, Luke it, it didn't elaborates. give that much to the ascension uh, at the end of Luke, so he thought, right, I better, you know, patch up there a mm. bit. Yeah. Um, sorry to bring it all down to earth too much, but um, uh, of course, we, we can't just blab on about introduction. We can, we can go into the scripture itself as well, but... Uh, I do, th I do think that there is something absolutely authentic about Luke. And uh, another interesting element, of course, we're not going into his, his gospel too much, but he, he does add things that are not in the other gospels. So it gives a, a, a sort of more detailed Detail, yes, yes. account. But we, we, we could probably do Luke after Acts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Um, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he, he was taken up into that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And that's where, as I said you know, earlier, that's where the Gospel of Luke ends. The Gospel of Luke yeah. ends with the ascension. Yeah. The disciples go back <coughs> and worship in the temple, and that's, yeah. that's where it ends. And then he's taking up the tale and with a slight overlap and a bit of elaboration of that ascension itself. Yes. Um, but even in that um, second verse, it, it says, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So he's, he's setting the scene already for the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, whereas the Gospels are very much focused on the physical, you know, uh, historic life of the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit played a role and the Lord breathed on his uh, disciples. And, you know, he, he mentions in this, you see as we see woven throughout the whole narrative of Scripture, the Holy Spirit, um, here he's, he's sort of setting it out. Well, the Holy Spirit the, is a key the, person of the book of Acts. Ab absolutely. And the way I would absolutely agree with you, the way I would put it is that what we have in the Gospels is an account of the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus mm. and then residing with him. Yeah. So that everything he does, he does from hearing his Father yeah. saying it, and then he just does it. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit resides with Jesus throughout the Gospels. Mm. What's different with Acts is the Holy Spirit comes upon all believers. Yeah, yeah. And it's a process, and it's not automatic. Yeah. Uh, Jesus actually said you have to wait mm. 
until I'm ready, mm. uh, or, or until God is ready uh, to, to set. I mean, that, 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 that's his last instruction yeah. before, before his ascension. So Luke begins to pad it out a bit, put, uh, put some colour to what he said at the end of... Um, you, you, um, you've mentioned, well, now we're on the Holy Spirit. Um, it, the Apostles' Creed, I think it is, that, that, that says the Holy, we believe in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, yes. and is worshipped, and with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified. There was a, a real schism or real difference in the early church over that one line. Now, you've mentioned, of course, the Lord received from, you know, the Father uh, through the Holy Spirit. Um, but there was a real contention over whether it should be, um, we believe, in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father to the Son instead of from the Father and the Son. And um, it's, it's a slight, uh, it, it seems, oh, well, what's the point of splitting the church over that? But it's interesting, Alan, again, you've raised something, I think, quite significant about the nature of the Trinity and the relationship I, I think, between think, well, the members well, well, of the Trinity. I don't want to bring too much contention no, my, on my, my, two my understanding it has but, to be both. Yeah. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. It says so. Yes, yeah. The Holy Spirit also proceeds from Jesus. Yeah, that's it, exactly. Because it also says so. But when you codify it in the creed, it well, says one, not the other. And that's what caused so much problems in, right. the, in the very early church. I, I, and therefore, I would say, add to the scriptures at your peril. And, you know, there are things that are held in tension in the scriptures. Yes. That if we try and create an article or a code uh, beyond the scriptures, we're going to get into yeah. a model. Yeah, but um, Ian, I saw you smiling when I... Because no, I, I, I'm not I, genuinely I, not I trying am, to be mischievous. I am, I'm just trying to unpack things. I, I, it's, it's one of these discussion things. I think the terminology mm -hmm. um, where, where we... We talk, we talk about the, the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk and about. It's going to be strong through Acts yeah, as we it's going to be strong. discuss it. Um, I mean, the baptism literally means immersed, mm. overflowing full. The question that is often posed is, was the Holy Spirit present in the Old Testament? among some of the Old Testament saints. Now, I would argue that he is. Yeah. And there were times where th they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they were able to prophesy. That's right. I mean, so it's Saul, like King Saul. He's King Saul, Saul King Saul, Saul, that's right. Uh, and there are times, actually, where you've got to distinguish. For example, uh, I think it's Psalm uh, 51, where it talks about spirit, but it's a small s. Was mm -hmm. talking about the spirit of man, mm. whereas mm. not uh, not the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, and you, if you study it in in one of the Bibles, you will see the difference. They mm -hmm. they, they distinguish between spirit e, capital S yeah. and spirit yeah. small yeah. s. So I mean, so the Holy Spirit was present in the Old Testament, and the Holy Spirit moved across the face of the waters. Correct. So he's know, been across. present throughout so time. He's there. He, he, it wasn't as though the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost uh, and sort of yeah. was ab abandoned. What it is, is that it, there was a living demonstration of the fullness, the baptism of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. over the, the, the disciples. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. where... And, I mean, one of the great discussions that there are today, and I'm glad it's not as uh, uh, vigorous discussion as it used to be yeah, 30, 40 no. years ago, where, where, you know, you had people talk about the baptism of the Spirit meaning uh, and the evidence of the baptism of the Spirit was speaking in tongues, mm -hmm. which is a classical uh, Pentecostal doctrine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, 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 or the, the, we Don't open up too many cans. No, no, no. I, I think it's important no, because, no, it's because I, I we're think on the subject. Pe people use shorthand these days, depending on the church they go to, and, and they never ever look at the other. Yeah. A point of view, That's right. which sometimes can help you yeah. to actually see a deeper understanding right. of God. Uh, and we can learn from Pentecostal Christians and, and their doctrine of the second baptism and their emphasis upon uh, the doctrine of, of tongues. But we can also learn from the theology of those where, where people talk about uh, the Holy Spirit and the evidence of the Holy Spirit presence is you know the fullness of the holy spirit and yeah. it's not a particular one-off 
experience. Right. It's a continuing blessing and yeah. fullness of the Holy so Spirit. So we're definitely going to unpack that. I'll just say this, that it says in this verse too, you know, he gave instruction through the Holy Spirit. We know the Lord breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But Alan, what do you think, uh, you know, what is it, why is it important that Luke should say he gave instruction through the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit's power in verse 2? I don't know whether it has it in your version written. It, it, do, it, do, it does. Yeah. In one sense, it's because it's a continuation. All of the Gospels say that Jesus <clears throat> operated in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said that. John the Baptist said it. And then at the transfiguration, God himself said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Mm. And so everything that Jesus did in the Gospels was mandated by God. Mm. It's very clear. Mm. And so in one sense, that, that is purely a continuation. Just because he's died and he's living a resurrected life, doesn't stop him continuing to do what God tells him to do. So even in the period between resurrection and ascension, Luke's makes it, Luke makes it 100% clear he's still operating in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, it's very obvious what it means for us. If you look at any of the epistles by any of the apostles, the same thing. We are to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Yeah. Romans 6, we're to be dead to our flesh. Mm. Yeah. We're alive in Christ. Alive in Christ means operating in the spirit That's right. and fulfilling God's mandate. Yeah. It, Paul, a bondservant, an apostle of Christ. It, they all cast themselves in that role and this is what they require of yeah. us mere mo mortal Christians as well. All Christians must operate in the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus. And Jesus himself reminded him, them of what he said in John's Gospel, chapter 14. Yeah. He said, the Comforter will come. That's right. You know, right. I'm going away. And they said, no, don't go away. Mm. Because they're dis a disciple is somebody who has someone to follow. Yeah. A disciple is somebody who has a master. Yeah. If the master goes, the disciples disband. Well, they didn't disband after his death. That's right. They didn't he, disband. He rose again. Well, he rose yeah. again, but he, yeah. after the ascension, they still didn't disband. Correct. Correct. Now, let's pick up on that, because this is, this is still, we're still in the first verse or so. Um, we talked about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Mm. I think we can talk a bit more about that, because he, he's basically summarized his whole uh, apostle by what Jesus began to do and teach. That says it. It says it all. I think we can talk more about the began um, uh, and the doing. So if he only began to do and teach, Luke is saying that he will continue to do and teach through the Acts. And while we're on the subject of the Holy Spirit, does it end with the, the biblical era? Because <laughs> there is a, you know, a, a view in the church, oh, all of the the doing, the teaching's fine. I mean, we can carry on teaching through the church age, but the actual doing and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, that was only during the biblical era. Well, it so comes back to what I said point. earlier yes. about the, the, the book of Acts appears not to have an ending. That's, it just that's stops. It, it just that's stops. It. And you think, well, where's the next verse? Because you're turning that's the right. page and say, I want more. So you're, yeah, so you're surmising that from the end of Acts. I'm asking Ian a sort of theological point in terms of the Holy Spirit's work. Was it a special splurge just at the beginning in the early church or was it something for the whole church age? No, I mean, the obvious answer to that question is, is that it is, the Holy Spirit is still yeah. at work yeah. in his church today. Yeah. Yeah. But without him, we can do nothing. Yeah. Um, there is a strong view, isn't there, that, you know, the, the miracles of the early church no, were, yeah, were, were yeah, unique to that era. Yeah, yeah, but I, I don't think, for example, when you have dispensationalism yeah. saying that the Holy Spirit was given for the apostles mm. at that particular period, I don't think they would then claim that the Holy Spirit is not present. Mm. Uh, in, you know, uh, you know I, yeah. they, do, they don't claim that. They, they claim that the gifts of the Spirit 
yeah. were for a season. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what dispensationalists that's believe, right. usually associate with Calvinists, as yeah. many people in the yeah. no, our viewers in Northern Ireland will be familiar with this, this yeah. doctrine. Yeah. But they're not saying that the Holy Spirit is not present in the heart of the believer, no. or, or the Holy Spirit uh, was not present yeah. throughout the Bible. They're not saying that no. at all. Um, the interesting thing is even during the life of the Lord Jesus, he said, look, someone could be, there were cynics in those days, yeah. and someone could be raised from the dead and you still wouldn't believe. Yeah. That, for me, it is a slightly inverted way of looking at where we are today, yeah. but um, just because we have cynics out there today who say no it's all you're, yeah. you're, you're cuckoo and, and living in fantasy land there were people in the days of jesus yeah. who believed that well I, i'll give you an example um which illustrates this you, you know later on the acts of the apostles will will read about peter's preaching where he preached and three thousand responded yeah. mm. i read a statistic recently that on every, any given day fifty-six thousand people become Christians worldwide. Mm. Mm. So the church grows mm. by 56,000 people mm. every day, wow. continues to grow. In other words, we, we talk about, oh, wouldn't it be great to get back to the days of the Acts of the Apostles? We're actually living in the days of the nice. Acts of the Apostles. Nice. We may not be seeing it in Britain at this present time, but there are many parts of the world, and indeed many parts of Britain, mm. where the Holy Spirit is at work Mm. in wonderful ways, mm. you know. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to read out from John 14, which... Yeah, yeah please do. <clears throat> ..is the, um, where, where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit coming. Mm. Uh, John 14, verse 25 says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. So while he's present, he's saying some stuff, because eventually he won't be there physically. But... The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will both teach new stuff, new revelation, which he gave to the apostles in the book of Acts, as well as bring to remembrance things that Jesus told the apostles mm. during his lifetime. Both, okay? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Because he's saying, there's no need with the Holy Spirit, there's no need for fear. Yeah, and, and verse 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, mm. because I go to my Father. Yeah. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Wonderful. You ask. So, so the context, as Alan so rightly said, is the, is the Holy Spirit. And um, I, 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 always, I, I know what Alan was doing in a sense of saying that, you know, we can do nothing without the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he's yeah. right, quite right. Yeah. Where I would sort of pull back a little bit and say, you know, to actually imply that Jesus did the work through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, for example, in, in, in Luke, there is a very, sorry, in, in John, there is a very, John 14, the, you know, Jesus says, I will come to you. Then later on he says, the Holy Spirit will come to you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and, 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 and there's a whole links of parallels where the presence of Jesus is equated to the presence of the of Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit. Yeah. of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, and so we have to be very careful not to distinguish, to say Jesus did, did his works through the Holy Spirit, because that implies, as some people have taken, not Alan, but some mm -hmm. people would interpret it as saying, you know, I, you know, I, I, can, you know I can be as Jesus, basically. Mm. Um, you know, uh, well, that, I, this is we're, what we're grappling with right at the beginning of Acts yeah. is is the the Trinity. Yeah, yeah. You know, that you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
and throughout the writings of Paul, you, you've got the spirit of Christ. He that doesn't have the spirit of Christ doesn't belong to it. And, and there is a sort of interchangeability element because they are three in one. Yeah, and so and we're, we're never going to completely fathom it, I don't think. Yeah. Even though it says in this passage, he will teach us all things, which I find quite unfathomable <laughs> as a phrase. I, that's the thing. That, um, at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, you know, it's, it's astonishing that Luke says, oh, I'm writing this stuff to you because we've gained a perfect knowledge now. <laughs> really? I know, I know. But in some sense, that is true. In the same way that in, uh, in 1 John, he says, you know, he who has the son cannot sin, cannot sin. Yeah. There, there are concepts here which seem to be holding things in tension. Yeah. Because John says, well, whoever says, I, I, you know, whoever says they have no sin, they're a liar. Yeah. And then yeah. a, little, a few verses along, he says, well, if you're in Christ, you cannot sin. Not that you don't, you cannot, you, you can, yeah. cannot. Yeah. So it's got to be because Christ is living in you. And the Christ in you can't sin. That's what he means. Yeah, exactly. And this goes back to what Ian was and saying. Romans seven, Paul wrestling with you know the fact that it's, it's yeah, it's not and, me, it's and the old man. Absolutely, Ian. I mean, you know, the Holy Sp walking in the Spirit and walking in Christ are almost interchangeable terms, and Paul uses both of them yeah. quite liberally. Yeah. You know, we are dead in Christ and alive in Christ. Yeah. And he's teaching us, and he's teaching his disciples. Um, giving instructions through the Holy Spirit, so that it's, it's a whole new ball game. It's the spiritual realm, and that takes, you, it's not, well, as we, as we know, it's spiritually revealed. Mm. You can't intellectualize it too much. No. The relationship uh, uh, with God is not an intellectual sort of communion. It's something that's much deeper than that. So, why... I mean, this we're, yeah. we're going to be grappling with all yeah. these questions, yeah. and, and an obvious question is that if Luke uh, wrote the, uh, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles mm. under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is present in the heart of the believer today, mm. why can't someone else just write a great book or Gospel which we can add to the Bible? Mm. Great question. Um, I, I th only, we only uh, take it from a revelation, not, don't add. Yeah. Don't add to this revelation. Yeah. And when Paul said all scripture you know, is inspired by God, this is the scripture. Uh, commentaries and revelations and testimonies through the church age are not the scriptures. And the great danger with that, as you know, is mission creep. And before you know it, the actual gospel message will become humanitarian yeah. or, or some other intrusion yeah. will come into it. I mean, th there are two wings of the church. I, I'm not even sure one yeah. side is a wing of the church, yeah. but nevertheless, I, I'll, I'll use that illustration. Yeah. First of all, we have conservative Christianity, mm. which, which then has an emphasis upon prophecy. Mm. And the danger with an emphasis upon prophecy is that it can almost become equivalent in practice the equivalent of scripture the guidance of scripture yeah you mean prophecy beyond what the prophets wrote in scripture no, a, a a prophecy of a particular course of action or yeah or, or whatever now on the other wing of the church the liberal wing of the church now I, you know i know this is a fact because i had to study it it is that mm. um, you know the word scripture doesn't mean what you think it is now i would actually mm. say to this to people who are studying theology who or read theological books be very careful these days when you read the word scripture Mm. Because the word scripture means different things to different theologians. Mm. You, know, it, it, you know, I've even heard the word scripture in a Christian theology book which refers to the words of Buddha. Yes. Because what they're talking about is a revelation. Mm. They're saying it's a revelation of God through Buddha, uh, Buddha the Buddha. Mm. Right? And, and, so, and so you have to be very careful, mm. you know, to understand that you know, the, the scriptures have been fixed in time and space. Yeah. Now, 
how it was fixed in time space, I think we've discussed this before. It's called the canon, the scripture, and then the canon literally means a measuring stick. Mm. And there was a measuring stick which, which applied. First of all, was, it, was this account widespread and authoritative in the early church? And, what, you know, mm. uh, and secondly, you know, is it, was it written by an apostle? Mm-hmm. And those, those, those two, and the third one is actually is the Old Testament scriptures, you know, sure. the adoption of the Old Testament. But so, so the, there is that measuring stick. So sometimes there's a misunderstanding, and again, I remember saying this before here in this Bible, but it bears repeating, is that people got under the misunder, misapprehension that, as it were, there was a big conference and they decided, oh, we'll put that book in, we'll take that That's one out, it. we'll do this. And mm. It never worked like that. No. It emerged over many, many centuries. Mm. So, so then you had at the Council of Nicaea, they said, this is the stamp. Yeah. This is the authority. You cannot add any yeah. more. Yeah to the scriptures. And by the way, that you know, in the lays of ancient Rome, it says there be 30 chosen prophets, the wisest of the land, who always by last portion of both morn and evening stand, evening and morn the 30, hath termed the verses all, traced from the rites by linen white, by mighty seers of yore. I mean, I mean frankly, you can have any scriptures, as you've yeah. said. And what distinguishes these scriptures um, is a really important question. <laughs> and it's only proved, really, through the centuries yeah. that I, this is God's I, word. And it's going on today. And, by the way, you said about prophecy. I, I, I personally think that that is the authenticating stamp of the scriptures, that they are prophetic. It's one quarter of, of the whole of our canon says uh, beforehand what is going to ha- take place later, and that uh, about the Messiah, about the working of the Holy Spirit, about Israel, about physical things, for me, and they come to pass, for me, that is an authenticating stamp. And I do think that there's a role for the prophetic ministry in Britain today, in the church today, and I think it's important. We need people who would speak for God in a prophetic way. And I don't only mean preach, I mean give a specific word you know, but it's always based upon the scripture. For example, I can remember preaching one day um, before the great crash in yeah. 2008, was it? Mm. Something well, like that. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah the, the, the credit the, crunch. The credit one. crunch. And I was preaching on uh, money, mm. basically, Timothy and that. That was good and timing. S- and so, no, no, but it was before. <laughs> yeah, and that's what a, I mean. Year, it's good a year timing. before. Good timing. And the Lord showed me distinctly that. We had to, to, to warn the people to look at their investments mm. because they could crash. Mm. And, and I, was, I, I was absolutely convinced that God was saying to, to, through me to warn my congregation Great. about their investments. Right. Wow. And, 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 and um, I, you know, there have been times in that ministry, mm. which I, I won't go in my ministry, where, where God lays something on. Yeah. But it's always based around scripture yeah you know the, 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 you know and so and we're we really get, going into the foundation and where we get error here. is where people say the scripture says this but we've had a further effort uh, uh, you know like danger. joseph smith that you know and, you know and things like that we've had a further uh, and this is it you know is and this is where the error is and this is where it's important that in those first verses where the holy spirit led luke to understand you know, the authority of the Bible. Mm. By, by the way, you've mentioned Pentecostalism and the like. Um, that, that something has happened during this last century where um, people have become accustomed to saying that because of this direct revelation of the Holy Spirit, we can go beyond the scriptures. And I've spoken to charismatics who basically say, well, you know, um, God can change his mind, and there are precedents in scripture. Um, and, you know, it, that what is wrong with having a direct revelation which is beyond the scripture? And, and that, that there's um, obviously scriptural precedents. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But the danger of that is, is that you, you emerge with ayatollahs, who mean mm. oracle from God. I get my direct revelation, listen to me, and that then goes contrary to the, the whole theme of the scriptures, which is we're all Inci subject incidentally, to God. This is why I, his word. I do think it's important to be part of a fellowship where you come yeah. under the yeah. teaching of the word of God and yeah. the authority of the word of God because the danger is, and I know there are mm. people who yeah. watch yeah. Who, who would love to be at church but can't get to church. Sure. But if we can get to church, we shouldn't, you know, we, we shouldn't actually, although we're saved as individuals to come to Christ, we're saved into the church. That's what we'll see in the Acts of the Apostles. Mm. Mm. You know, they were baptized into a church. Yeah into a fellowship of believers, because then the, the Word of God can be uh, studied together. And yes, you can receive teaching on yeah. the Word of God yeah. as well. And I think it's important, this. I'm not trying, don't great. get me wrong, I'm no, not. I'm just thinking of Alan sitting there, you know, patiently. I, We're in our last nine minutes. Okay, so, uh, sorry, um, so we, I think we, um, we sort of had a prophetic thought that this wouldn't, we wouldn't be going too far into this passage and it would be introductory. So should we it stay is, on that it is, for the last few minutes? It is introductory yeah. and insofar as the canon of scripture is concerned, yeah. I think the timing of the books is quite significant as well. Mm -hmm. So Acts was written round about 60-ish, 60, 61 maybe. Mm -hmm. um, all of Paul's letters were written before AD 70. He didn't witness the sacking of Jerusalem. I think he died before then. Peter also. John survived that. That's right. And John's writings were sort of late 80s, early 90s. Even some people even put it as mid to late 90s, some of them. Yeah. And Revelation is probably the last book that was written. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that earlier. And you yeah. said and, uh, Revelation almost rounds off everything that had been written up to then. Yeah. So John must have been familiar with all the writings of Peter and Paul and Luke and Matthew and amazing Mark and thoughts. James and he'd read it all. Yeah, amazing thought. In a sense, he wrote the Gospel of John in order to um, fill the gaps in the Synoptic Gospels. Yeah. Okay. There were some things that he saw mm. that he knew were significant, so he thought, right, I'm just going to write this down, and that was written. Um, for folks again, who, as we're sort of broadcast right well beyond the Christian club, as it were, what does synoptic mean in terms of synoptic gospels? Well, to me, it means yeah. that it, it sort of um, it's, it's an account, yeah. logical, chronological, sort of one thing it's a narrative. to another. It's a narrative. It's a, narrative. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. there's a timeline to it. Yeah. Uh, John sort of dips in and out and the sort of themes and is that's almost exactly. all over the place. Yeah, that's And exactly. it's very diff difficult yeah. to put, you know, put your finger on. But that's quite a thought, isn't it? This turbulent first century AD um, was when all of this happened and yeah. was written. But it's almost like John writes Revelation, which is the last book we believe to have been written in the scriptures, and signs off on it. Mm. Yeah, it's like over and out on a, on a microphone. Yeah. He's, 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 he does, the first he? century language saying over and out, done, yeah. amen. Yeah. He says amen twice in the last two verses. Yeah. He who testifies, he's talking about Jesus, to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Mm. Amen. Mm. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Yeah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Yeah. Finished. There's That's nothing it. else to say in terms of scripturally being written down. Yeah. That is it. We have the body of the Word of God, the written Word of God. Jesus, the living Word of God. We have His Spirit. Yeah. We have the Holy Spirit. But they mm. combine. They, they're not going to diverge. Yeah. And so. if, if it didn't, if it wasn't, you know, if, it didn't, if we didn't have those bookends, I think you, you could say that logically the whole thing could unravel because um, just rolling down through the centuries with every, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry. Uh, absolutely. Coming, coming in with his We do insights. have the book ends. Genesis starts with, in the beginning, God. Yeah. Yeah. Revelation ends with, even so, um, you know, um, I'm coming quickly. Amen. And why would you want to add to... 
um, you know, let's say the law, the prophets, the Psalms, the revelation of the Lord Jesus and his immediate disciples. Um, that is a pretty chunky, meaty, you know, revelation, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, if you were to then go, you know, again, through the centuries, it would dilute. If you were to say, right, everything that happens in succeeding centuries is of equal merit and, you know, mm. and authority as God's word, yeah. you get into corruption. And it has to be said, you, you know, there is this view that the church has equal authority or even more authority than the Bible that has proved through church history to cause a, a terrible error, suffering. Mm -hmm corruption and the like. Uh, okay, I'm sure we're down to our last five minutes now. Um, I, I think, um, Ian, we, we're living in an age today which, of course, we've had church history, we, we've had the Roman Catholic Church, we've had the institutional church, and you mentioned, oh, it's important to go to church, as it were, but even that seems to be disintegrating in our time. I'm not willing it on, but I'm just observing that we have many folks watching um, from home. Some of them are not able to get to church, but others find it very difficult to find a spiritual home absolutely. today. Yeah, 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 uh, absolutely. And that, that's what I was going to say before at the end. And Mm. Uh, is that I'm not actually talking about the institutional church. Because the early church was meeting in homes. Yeah. I'm not talking about the institutional church. Sometimes there are good institutional churches. There's good mm. Church of England churches, good yeah. Church of Ireland churches. There are good yeah. um, Baptist churches, not and Pentecostal everywhere. churches, yeah. but er everywhere. And sometimes they're part of an institution, but uh, what you would see. But everywhere, uh, but, but not but, everywhere. But, 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 but we're talking about the fellowship of believers that mm. that's, that's that's what right. we're talking about yeah. um, whether they go to a church or, or whatever mm. and the importance of actually having scripture explained and actually coming under the authority yeah. of, of of other believers yeah. to, to to teach I, I thank god for the times where people have corrected me in, yes. in the nicest possible way uh, sometimes not nice, no, no, possible no. Way. But, 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 but. But then iron gen, sharpens iron. Yeah, gen, 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 I, I thank God for that. And those who have been instructive to me and have been character forming, mm. Christian character forming, mm. um, because of that. That wouldn't have happened if I had withdrawn. And, right. and, and, and of course, we go through difficult times. I tell you this if, if I've been through some very difficult times, and sometimes as a pastor, there have been times where I would never want to go in church again. Mm. Uh, to be quite frank, mm. I, I, you know, the, the way sometimes I, I felt I was treated as a minister, yeah. you know, just a minority of people, I but know. nevertheless, yeah. it had a yeah. great effect on me. There were times I did not want to go to church anymore. Mm. And I had to go and discipline myself to go yeah. to church because I believe that is what Christ loved the church. Yeah. Or even though that it is faultly and yeah. full of people like myself who spot some wrinkles, who, who, who are, yeah. and are yeah. far from perfect. Well, can I just say, we're really looking forward to um, <laughs> going through this wonderful account from Luke of the Book of Acts. We're, we're looking forward to hearing more of Ian's anecdotes. We're, you know, we're looking forward to uh, seeing how it is brought up to date to our lives. And I, I would say that we can all learn much from it, apply it to our lives, see how Paul, um, as it unfolds, but we'll start next week, Alan, with uh, the, the Lord's Ascension, what he said to his disciples right at the very beginning regarding the Holy Spirit. And hopefully we've given you a little bit of a taste of what is to come and we haven't blown it. And <laughs> you think, oh no, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna <laughs> sit this one out. So. Don't forsake the gathering together of the brethren. See you next week.